Well, it's that time again. School buses are rolling. We've done our school shopping. We put our precious little ones on those huge yellow taxis, all school buses. School is back in, but there's a big question that remains, and that is this. Isn't it time for us to not only send our kids back to school, but for us to go back to God? In this episode of the Midweek Refill, I'm going to share with you five ways to rekindle your relationship with God. I'm Bishop Littman. You're watching the Midweek Refill. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I am Bishop A. Reginald Littman, your host and senior pastor of the New Mountaintop Church here in Winston, Georgia. That's 30 minutes west of downtown Atlanta. We're excited to have you here for this amazing study as we talk about five ways to rekindle your relationship with God. You know, it is easy for relationships to wane and for us to begin to lose the significance, the awe, the excitement of a relationship. And while that is true with people, it is equally, if not even more so true, about our relationship with God. By the way, down in the description box below is a free PDF that will help you to take a deeper dive in today's study. So let's talk about five ways that you and I can rekindle our relationship with God as we talk about going back to God. The number one way to get back to God in this season of our lives, which is filled with so much turmoil, so much exterior pressure, is number one, to prioritize prayer. Prioritize prayer. And for this particular point, I want to point your attention to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, and it reads like this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is telling us, as he's writing this letter, not to be anxious, but that we must prioritize prayer. Actually, Philippians was not written to us. It was written to the saints who had been converted from Judaism in the city of Philippi during one of Paul's missions there in Macedonia. And you can find the backdrop of the book of Philippians in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas were conducting a prayer meeting that was taken over the nation, and they were thrown in jail in Acts 16. Paul is still in prison. He's under house arrest for his work in ministry, and he writes that book of Philippians to the church at Philippi vicariously to believers today to remind us of the need to not be nervous, worried, or anxious, but instead to be prayerful. So we're not to be full of care, full of concern, full of angst. We are to be full of prayer. And that's what Paul teaches us, is that if we're going to go back to God, we've got to go back to prayer. And prayer must be a priority in our lives. My friends, prayer is our direct line of communication to God. When you prioritize prayer, you literally prioritize your ability and right to communicate with the Heavenly Father. So what are some ways that we can prioritize prayer? Well, we can start every single day, every single morning with words of appreciation to God. You know, prayer doesn't have to be long, drawn out, extensive. It doesn't have to be loud. It doesn't have to be demonstrative. You don't have to wake up the whole neighborhood to prioritize prayer. But as soon as your eyes open, Start right there. Lord, thank you for one more day. You've allowed me to see. As soon as your foot hits the floor, Lord, thank you 
for allowing me to walk on my legs, to have feet, to have legs to stand on. And you may say, well, Bishop, that's a little simple and elementary. No, my friend, what that is, is not simple and elementary. It is profound and it is productive and it makes prayer a priority in your life. There are times when we all feel as if our back is against the wall. Maybe like we're locked up in situations and life has us captured. But there's a second principle I want to share with you this week about how you can go back to God. Number two, meditate on scripture. Again, meditate on scripture. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water, which brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. To meditate on God's word literally means to read it, recite it, repeat it, write it, and apply it. When you're reading the word of God, it helps you to then invest and ingrain and deposit into your mind and your spirit what God has written for your life. So as we meditate, it literally means that we read it. We then recite it. That means we're memorizing it. We're encapsulating it in our minds. We're writing down what it is that God is saying to us. Have you ever stepped on a bug? Of course you have. You know what came out? I don't mean to gross you out, but we call it guts. Whatever's on the inside of the bug comes outside of the bug when it is under the pressure of a foot. When life steps on you. The best way to respond in the right way is to fill your spirit and your mind up with what God's word says and how you understand it to be speaking to you. That's why meditation is so important. Life is going to bring pressure. There are going to be moments where your coworkers, your neighbors, your relatives, your friends, maybe even your spouse or your kids or your parents are going to put pressure on you. What comes out of your mouth when pressure is applied to your life? Well, if you will meditate on God's word, God's word will be what comes out of your mouth. And my friends, that's a recipe for victory. So we have to meditate on God's word. And that's how we can go back to God. What I love most about meditating is that as I'm walking along life's way, as I'm doing my work, whatever it may be, I can also be concentrating on what it is that God is saying to me in that moment. The power of memorizing scripture is that no matter where you are, you can still be in touch with God. It's kind of like Wi-Fi. When you have a data plan for your cell phone or your device, it doesn't matter that much where you are as long as you have a clear signal to be able to connect to the satellite. That's what the Word of God does in your life. It gives you that clear signal, despite wherever you may be, that enables you to connect with the satellite, which is God himself. So memorizing scripture is a powerful tool to help you get back to God. One reality that I've personally found is that the more I meditate on scripture, the more thankful I become. And that leads us to our third principle for this study, and that is that we must practice gratitude. Paul teaches us in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse 16 through 18, he says there, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you about the benefits of gratitude. Gratitude shifts our focus from those things that we lack to all that God has provided for us. Gratitude helps us to recognize the provisions of God in our lives 
and that everything in our lives is something that we should be indeed thankful to God for. The good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, the hard times, all of it finds its way onto your list of things to thank God for. And you may be saying, well, how is that possible? Well, very simply this. If you lived through divorce, job loss, pandemic, whatever it may be, you lived through it. It did not take you out. You're still here. Therefore, you have every reason in the world to be thankful to God for all of his benefits in your life. So practicing gratitude means that we express our thanksgiving to God for every little thing, every single day, every single moment. And when you live a practice of gratitude, you will find that you are much happier, more fulfilled, more satisfied with everything that happens in your life because you're linking it all back to God's divine purpose for you. Number four is serve others. In Matthew 25, verse 35 through 40, Jesus gives quite a message there. And he, in essence, talks about the fact that what we do for the least, the lost, and the left out, he considers it as us serving him. There's nothing quite like serving others to help us to get back to God and back to godly principles. After all, Jesus exemplified servitude. The heart that he showed toward humanity was one of serving. You and I can get back to God literally by serving other people, by looking after the needs of the least, the lost, the left behind, and the left out. How can we apply that even in this election? Well, we can think about the principles and the practices and the promises that candidates are making concerning those who are considered in our world marginalized or the least, the lost, the left behind, and the left out. Do those principles align with what Jesus taught in this passage of scripture? If they do, then that might be a candidate you want to consider when you can see alignment with our divine assignment. But if they don't, then you also want to take that into account and only choose to follow those who follow the principles of Scripture. Fifthly, if we're going to go back to God, we've got to embrace worship and praise. Psalm 95, verse 1 through 7, I believe it is, is an extensive litany of all the things that are involved in worship. Worshiping, bowing down, kneeling before the Lord, lifting our hands, and all of that. You know, many people today have chosen to worship at home. And while I have no real problem with that, my question for that is, are you indeed participatory in worship? Are you kneeling? Are you praying? Are you lifting your hands? There's something very powerful about connecting with believers in the house of God. Because when we connect with believers in the house of God, we're challenged to worship together. And I love how that psalm opens about, come let us worship. It's talking about the plurality of worship and the need for corporate worship as we come together. Friends, if you truly and indeed want to come back to God, I don't mean that you've backslidden. I just mean getting closer to him. Then employ these five principles that I've shared with you in this teaching. God wants you to be close to him, and he wants to be closer to you. But guess what? God didn't move. We did. Listen, this is Bishop Littman. You've been watching the Midweek Refill. Don't forget that right down in the description box below is a free PDF handout. It accompanies this teaching. It lists out all of the scriptures and all of the principles. And I've included 10 personal discovery questions to help you take a deeper dive into the scriptures so that you can gain more out of this study. Well, until next time, this has been Bishop Littman with the Midweek Refill. Don't forget to check out my brand new podcast. And I look forward to sharing God's word with you every Sunday right here on this same channel, 9.30 a.m. Until next week, you go with God.